Okay, so uh, the next speaker is uh, Marco Perin, who will talk about joint work with Benini, Schenkel, and Voike on categorification of algebraic quantum field theories. Please go ahead. So, hi all. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing such an amazing event that has connected so many people. And yeah, so I'm here today to talk about the joint work with uh, Marco Benini, Alexander Schenkel, who is my supervisor, and Lucas Foike, that you can find on the archive. So, for disclaimer, before I start, everything I'm going to say is going to be pretty introductory, uh, actually super introductory, so please don't be put off by this first slide. And so the aim of my talk is to introduce and compare two notions of algebraic quantum field theory. We have a one categorical version and a two categorical version. And why do we want to do that? And the reason is that one categorical equities are not enough to describe gauge theories, and we will see later on what this means. And the second reason is that we would like to promote the use of higher categorical techniques in the mathematical physics community. And so two EQFTs are a good starting point since one can obtain concrete examples. So the structure of my talk will be the following. First of all, I would like to try to explain all the mambo jumbo. So what is an observable? What is an algebraic quantum field theory? So then I would like to discuss why should we consider higher categories? And then just at the end, I will discuss some uh, simple results and examples. So uh, the main interest for us today is the category of Lorentz and space times, and we denote by lock the following category. So the objects are the space time. Uh, a space time for me is just one of these diamond regions in which every point can be identified with a position and the time coordinate. So, for example, you can think of your room in a certain time span in one hour. That is your space time. And these space times have the property that you can always tell the future and the past of an event. And then we have to define morphisms. The morphisms are just the embeddings of space times. So in particular, they are inclusions of these smaller diamond regions into bigger ones. And then we have to introduce this definition. We have to say that F1 from N1 to N and F2 from N2 to N are causally disjoint if Jn, F1, N1 intersected with F2 and 2 is equal to the empty set, where Jn F1 and 1 is the light cone of F1 and 1. So there is already a bit of mumbo jumbo here. We have to explain what the light cone is. So the light cone of M1 is simply this light blue area here. And what does it represent physically? Uh, so you know that in physics, nothing uh, travels faster than the speed of light. No physical influence is possible. Uh, travels faster than the speed of light. Uh, so, uh, if something happens in this region N1, the effect will, of it won't be felt by all the points in the region N, but just the points um, in this light blue area will, can be affected by it. And uh, for two regions to be causally disjoint, it simply means that whatever happens in N1, it won't influence M2 and vice versa. So there is no causal relationship between the two. And now we have to discuss what is an observable in physics. So an observable is simply a thing you can measure in a certain time and space region M. So for example, now you're in your room and you could measure the temperature in your room. That is an example of an observable. Um, and the thing is that there are fundamental differences in classical and quantum physics. So in classical physics, everything works out fine. So if you make an experiment, if you make a measurement, uh, this won't interact with your system. And especially it's not really important the order in which you make two measurements. So for example, if you measure uh, the position and the momenta of a mosquito in your room flying around, it doesn't really matter the order in which you perform these two measurements. And this is expressed in the classical setting by saying, okay, if X and P are observables in M, then xp equal px is an observable in n so observables in the classical setting form a commutative algebra so something with a multiplication that commutes but things get a bit nastier in the quantum setting uh, so if you make a measurement this will affect your system 
And it's really important the order in which you make uh, measurements, and this has something to do with uh, Eisenberg ascent in principle. And how can we express this mathematically? Okay, we say that if x and p are observable in M, then xp and px are still observables, but they don't commute in general. So observables in the quantum setting form a non-commutative algebra. And then we can finally uh, study what an algebraic quantum field theory is. So an algebraic quantum field theory is simply a factorial assignment of algebras of observables to space-time regions. So this means that to every space-time, so for example, your room in a certain time span, you associate uh, the algebras of observables over it. But uh, we want these functors to satisfy uh, something more called the Einstein causality axiom. And it says the following. So first I will read it out and then I will try to explain it. Uh, it says that for causally disjoint F1 from M1 to N and F2 from N2 to N, uh, the following diagram commutes. So you can start from the observables attached uh, to the region M1 and the region N2 tensor them together. You can apply AF1 tensor AF2 to end up here. You can do the same thing on this other side and then you can either multiply or opposite multiply your observables, meaning that you can switch their order and multiply them, and you should obtain the same result. So this Einstein causality axiom is just telling us that observables coming from causally joint regions commute with each other, which might sound a bit funny since we just said that um, in, quant in the quantum setting, we would like observables to not commute in general, so why is there any difference in this particular case? The intuition is that, again, nothing propagates faster than the speed of light. And so if you make a measurement in this region M1, the effect of it won't be felt by this region M2 and vice versa. So um, measurement observables uh, coming from causally uh, disjoint regions behave with respect to each other, like in the classical setting, since they do not interfere. So they commute, uh, that's the, the basic idea. And then one can form a category, the category AQFT, whose objects are the AQFTs, and you have as one morphisms, the natural transformations. And so this definition works perfectly fine, uh, but it has a, a bit of an issue in the sense that uh, this, ax this Einstein causality axiom is something external we are asking our funders to satisfy. And uh, this is a bit annoying because um, uh, we would like to generalize this construction to uh, higher uh, categories. And so we need something else in order to rephrase it better. And there are also some other technical reasons on why we want to change a bit our definition. And so we have to introduce symmetric multi-categories and multi -functors. And I know that you know more than me about symmetric multi-categories, so I will be super brief. So a category is just a collection of objects with one to one morphisms. In a multi-category, instead you have a collection of objects, but the morphisms are n to one. So you have morphisms with n inputs and one output. And uh, our multi-categories are also symmetric in the sense that if you have a tuple, C1, Cn, and a permutation sigma, then you can apply sigma to an operation. So you can start from this operation from C1, Cn to T, and you can apply sigma and you can end up in C sigma one, C sigma n to T. So an operation from these permuted inputs to uh, this output. And why do we want to, why do we want this? Uh, it's just because uh, as I said before, we would like to uh, exchange the order of our observables and this uh, will be the role of this permutation later. And then we can define multi and the multi fee from P2O is just a structure preserving map. So it will assign in particular to every operation in the source multi-category, an operation in the target multi-category. And uh, multi are required to satisfy some axioms. And the most important for us today will be this uh, equivariance axiom, which tells you that you can either apply phi to an operation and then permute the inputs via sigma, or you can first permute the inputs using sigma, and then apply phi, and you should obtain the same result. 
and we are ready to define um, AQFTs in terms of multi categories. And how can we do this? We define the multi category algae K, whose objects are associative and unital K algebras. And now we have to say what are the morphisms with n inputs and one output. So, morphism from a tuple A to a target would be simply a morphism from the tensor product, A1, tensor, tensor, AN, to the target. So morphisms are things of this kind. They are more uh, maps from a tensor product to a target. And then we have to define this other multi-category, which is called P-lock. The objects are the space times. And the morphisms are two poles of mutually causally disjoint space time embeddings. So what does it mean? A morphism from M1, M2, M3 to N is simply an embedding of M1, M2, M3 as two by two causally disjoint regions of N. So these are our new um, morphisms. And then one can realize that an AQFT is nothing else uh, than a multifunter A from P lock to Alg K. So as you can see here, uh, if this is correct, we are rephrasing uh, our whole definition of AQFT in this new manner. And we don't have to ask anything external to be satisfied. And how can we see that this result holds true? It's not super immediate, but uh, so what does a multifunter do uh, on PLOC? It will associate to every space time an algebra of observables. It will associate to every uh, tuple of uh, mutually causally disjoint space time embeddings, a morphism of algebras. And then the equivariance axiom, so this compatibility with permutations of the multifunter implies the Einstein causality axiom. So this is not really immediate to see, but you can uh, imagine this thing saying, okay, if you take an operation, an operation is coming from causally disjoint regions, then you can permute the observables using these permutations and everything must be well, so it commutes. But the thing now is that one, AQFTs are not enough to describe gauge theories. And why is that? So um, observables are linked to, field, to things called fields. And in uh, one algebraic quantum field theories, we are associating to every space time a set of observables, an algebra of observables. And this is good to describe ordinary field theories because in ordinary field theories, equality of two fields is a property. So two fields are the same if they are the same on the nose. And so ordinary fields form a set. And uh, ah, fields are things like the gravitational field, the electromagnetic field, and all these kind of things. The issue is that in gauge theories, uh, equality of two fields is a structure. So two fields, a and the prime are the same if there is a narrow G connecting them. Uh, these arrows are called gauge transformations. So in ordinary field theories, we have a set of things. In gauge theories, we have a collection of objects with arrows, so a category of uh, gauge theories, of gauge fields. And how can we visualize this uh, thing? So equality as a structure. Uh, so let's say we have uh, three balls, um, two blue balls and one red ball. And let's say we're just interested in their colors and not in the order in which they come. Uh, so we have these two balls configurations, uh, the one on the left and the one on the right. And for us, uh, they are the same because uh, we're just interested uh, about the color, not in their order. Uh, so how can we say that they are the same? We simply say, okay, there is a permutation sigma connecting them that is witnessing their equality. And one AQFTs are um, good to study ordinary field theories, again, because it's enough to consider algebras of observables. So in particular, sets of observables. But for gauge theories, one needs uh, at least to um, associate a collection of objects with arrows. So one needs a categorified version of algebras of observables. And that's why we are passing to two EQFTs, which are not anyhow sufficient to describe gauge theories in general, but they are a step toward, let's say. And uh, we have seen that EQFTs can be described in terms of multi-categories. So we want to um, proceed in the same way for two EQFTs. 
uh, but one level higher. So instead of one multi-categories, we consider two multi-categories and a weak version of two multi-functors called pseudo-multi-functors. And now we have to replace the multi-category k of associative algebras with the two multi-category of locally presentable k-linear categories PRK. So, uh, as I said before, in one EQFTs, we are associating a set of observables and algebra of, of observables. And now we have to associate to every space time a categorified version of algebras of observables. And this is what this uh, PRK is doing. And then we define uh, two EQFTs in the same way we define one EQFTs. So, a two EQFT is a pseudo multifunter from PLOC to PRK. So here we are just changing uh, the target. And then we can define a two category, the two category of eight, uh, two AQFTs. So um, the objects are the two AQFTs, uh, the one morphisms will be the pseudo multinatural transformations and the two morphisms will be uh, the modifications. And now one may wonder what is the relationship between one and two AQFTs? And there is this theorem which states the resist uh, by a junction which exhibits the category AQFT of ordinary AQFTs as a co-reflective full two subcategory of the two category two AQFT, which simply means, okay, the unit of this adjunction by adjunction is an isomorphism. So whenever you take an algebra quantum field theory, you apply IOTA to obtain a two algebra quantum field theory and you apply to go back, then you obtain something that is isomorphic to what you were departing from. And this Fantor Yota is actually pretty easy to describe. It assigns an AQFT A to the two AQFT, which assigns to every space time M. Now we need to uh, assign a category. So we assign the category of modules over AN. And this is something to do with uh, algebraic geometry and the fact that uh, for um, uh, Spaces in physics, it's better to consider quasi coherent shifts over them to, to study them. But um, anyhow, we say that uh, B, a two algebra quantum field theory, is truncated if the component of the co unit at B is an equivalence. So, in particular, this means that a uh, two EQFT is truncated if it is equivalent to one algebra quantum field theory. So, if it doesn't represent anything new with respect to the past. Uh, so we are actually not really interested in truncated things. We would like to obtain non-truncated things. So the question is, how can we obtain something uh, new? And there is a machinery to do this, which comes from finite group actions. Uh, so this might look uh, uh, a bit technical, but it's really not. It's just a matter of uh, mambo jumbo. So uh, a G equivalent QFT is a pair a row consisting of an object A, an algebraic quantum field theory, and the representation of G as automorphisms of A. So we have A here with some automorphisms represented by elements of G. And there is a functor called uh, categorified orbifold construction that produces a, a two QFT out of a G equivalent one. And there is a really explicit description. So here, instead of assigning the normal algebra, you're assigned to every space time the G equivalent modules over AM. And there is this theorem, which says that given a G equivalent AQFT, A row, its orbifoldization AG is truncated if and only if the action of G is free of Galois for all M. So it doesn't really matter that we understand what is easy. It simply means that um, uh, the orbifoldization is non-truncated if and only if the action of G is non-free. And it's actually pretty easy to obtain uh, examples of um, uh, G equivalent QFTs with a non-free action. And so, uh, and these are really easy to compute. And so uh, I'm done basically. I want just to give you this take home message. So the take home message is that uh, AQFTs are not sufficient to describe gauge theories, and one would need infinity QFTs uh, to treat them in full generality. Uh, as an intermediate step, we developed a framework for two QFTs and discussed some really simple results. And uh, two QFTs are a nice place uh, to start uh, as an application of two category theory to mathematical physics. 
And we constructed also some examples of theories with gauge symmetries given by finite group G, these orbifold things we have built before. And so in particular, we obtain uh, pretty easy examples of two EQFTs which are uh, non-truncated. And yeah, this is it and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, so, are there questions? Um, there were many questions in the chat, but I think most of them, or maybe all of them, have been uh, answered along the way. Um, are there more questions? Uh, Pablo, uh, Paolo, maybe you can just speak up. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the presentation, by the way. Very nice. Uh, so I can see why you would want your field configurations to form a groupoid in the case of gauge theory, mm -hmm. but uh, what is the physical motivation for even higher than two? For even higher than two? Then one, I mean, as far as I know, one should consider uh, a gauge transformation up to uh, uh, homotopy, basically up to gauge transformation, up to gauge transformation. And so one would need uh, infinity. Uh, QFTs, but yeah, I'm not really, um, yeah, an expert in this, to be honest. Thank you. Okay. So next is Alex. Hi, I'm, I'm going to ask a question, though I don't know what all the words in the question mean. Um, so a criticism I've heard of AQFT is that it can't handle interacting field theories. It can only handle free field theories. Uh, is is this kind of toward solving that, or can you make some comment about that? Uh, yeah, so the only comment I can make is that I'm more on the mathematical side, so <laughs> the, the uh, physics thing is uh, quite out of uh, my knowledge. Uh, but yeah, maybe um, there is my supervisor, I think, around in the chat, maybe can reply to this. Uh, but yeah, I don't have any idea, to be honest. <laughs> Alex Schenkel, do you want to speak up or should we? Am I unmuted? Yeah, yeah, you're on. Oh, very good. Yeah, AQFT deals with interactive field theories as badly as any other approach, I would say, because non perturbative interactions are hard from any approach you take. And um, we can get examples in low dimensions, like two dimensions. But of course, not even close to four dimensional realistic theories. Okay, thanks. Um, I also have a question myself. So when you uh, describe the multi-category structure of this Lorentzian manifolds category, uh, it reminded me of uh, factorization algebras. Yeah, yeah. And Can it's you perfectly on that? Yeah, actually in the first uh, year, we have worked uh, towards uh, model independent comparison between uh, factorization algebras and algebra quantum field theory to prove they are the same, at least from a one categorical uh, uh, level. And uh, yeah, the, the question is open whether they are the same from an infinity categorical perspective. But yeah, the, I mean, uh, the, the, this is actually a super nice uh, observation. They, they should really be the, the same thing. Um, then there's a question from Abel. Abel asks, if that, does it mean that there is a notion of renormalization group flow? That's the question. Ah, okay, I don't know. Uh... Well, um, that's a fair answer. <laughs> um, any more questions or comments? Otherwise, let's thank uh, Marco again. Thank you.